Two. This segment is brought to you by Black Hills Information Security, the leaders in penetration testing and active defense. Email consulting at blackhillsinfosec.com to request a quote today. And by the SANS Institute, the most trusted source for computer security training, certification, and research. Visit sans.org to learn more. And by Tenable Network Security, creators of Nessus, the world's best vulnerability scanner. Jumpstart your security program today and evaluate Security Center's CV, the continuous monitoring solution. Visit Tenable.com for more information. I don't know if you have this graphic ready, but Larry is teaching SAN 617 wireless ethical hacking and defense, uh, and defense even, coming up in Las Vegas, September 14th through the 19th, and lots more places. So be certain to check the SANS website for more course offerings. Welcome back, everyone. We've got an illustrious panel of experts <laughs> to talk uh, about the security news this week, and we've added to our panel of experts, Mr. Joff Fire is now here. Welcome, Joff. Well, thank you, Paul. It's good to be here. I just flew in, and uh, I'm glad I could uh, join you on the podcast. I just flew and in, boy, and your boy, arms, arms are, are tired. tired. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <That's right. laughs> they really are. That flapping is really tough. <laughs> yeah, you got to be careful. All that fapping will make your arms tired. Um, oh. So, <laughs> oh. So, I don't uh, know. We have WordPress vulnerabilities. I know no, I teased that. Stop. There's plugins. That have vulnerabilities. We've talked about this agnosium. We've even discussed solutions to make the problem better, and people aren't listening. So I don't know what to do about it anymore. Mike, Carlos, Joff. Well, I mean, is it people is there, aren't listening, or is it that it, there's a there's a cycle? I mean, how quick? I mean, gosh, guys, how how quick are we still patching stuff from a decade ago? What, what's the reasonable expectation on when things uh, shift, change, or get better? I think it goes back to your idea, Mike, that wherever WordPress plugins are uploaded, that there is some kind of security check that happens. We talked so about that, something along those lines. So is that something then that, that we ask people to pay for? Like, how do we fund it? Yeah, I'd be willing to pay. So I, I think your idea that was make or come up with like an app store, like the Apple App Store, where mm -hmm. I would pay a dollar for a plugin that I use, um, and there's certain security checks that happen for that particular plugin. I would totally do that. I mean, so for the WordPress the model plugin, is, go ahead. there's got to be some sort of a scanner. You're a developer. You could put yourself in this. It goes through the scanning process, and it gets uh, a seal of approval, if you will. And, and that company has to continually scan. So if something changes, they notify you, right? So now, geez, we're talking about uh, time frame to remediation and everything else. I mean, like, I think the interesting part about it is we've, I've, I've probably oversimplified it because I think then the question is, okay, now when the scanner says, oh, there's a problem here, but, but you've already been approved, right? You've been approved. It's loaded up on yeah. my site. You're running version, with it. Version 2. Well, yeah, but now I, I find a problem. You would identify the problems before version 2 gets uploaded. Version 2 gets no, scanned and tested. No, I'm actually tested. saying it. All right, but, but, but that's also presuming that there's not something, there's not an update in the scanner, there's not an update in an right. attack right. down yes. the road. It doesn't eliminate the possibility that something gets in the store that has a vulnerability, but it greatly reduces it. And I think that yeah. my inclination, uh, and Carlos, I don't know how you feel about this, right, but the vulnerabilities are in WordPress plugins. I mean, they're pretty basic vulnerabilities that you could probably find with most scanners, right? Yeah, and not only that, um, I think if we want to take an approach at this, uh, we have to look and add kind of like as a penalty if you if, if you follow bad practices, I, I follow one mantra when I talk with people, and when when we're talking about security in the show, no, we are not getting security, or so and so is not getting security. The first thing I ask is a, a, an old sales question: Tell me how you're measured, and I'll tell you how you will behave. So, in, in the case of WordPress plugins, there's no kind of measure, there's no kind of guarantee, other than yes, it works. It shows this beautiful thing. Now, if you start giving rankings to developers on how good their code is, how secure their code is, and now they're getting hit by that, that's one point of measure. Uh, it will alter their behavior because it is something that they can get dinged on. Uh, and also WordPress can use that as their advantage for marketing. So another point of measurement uh, and that will impact their behavior. So 
I think it is kind of a problem that needs a uh, wider type solution than just automated scanning. It, it will need probably WordPress modifying a bit their framework mm -hmm. to just yeah. kind of put the extra layer mm -hmm. in that will eliminate a bunch of this repetitive stuff that keeps happening. Then you add the automatic stuff and somebody to look at it uh, probably before it act that doesn't last look before it actually goes into the store. And then you have kind of a ranking measure there for the developers for them to follow. And that will actually impact how they behave because now they're feeling pain. Now they have an incentive to, uh, to alter their behavior. That's, that's super, super smart uh, comments there, Carlos. It, I, I think to some of the things I've heard Mike say as well is that, and Mike, do you agree? I, what Carlos is saying is basically measurement in metrics can yep. be used to develop good habits and change behavior. Yeah, I, Carlos is a smart person. Yeah, um, if you give people an incentive, that, that's, that's right on target. If you give them an incentive. Yeah, I, I, I think that's the thing that's more interesting. As I'm listening to it now. You know, I mean, Carlos brought up the, the notion of a penalty, which, you know, fundamentally what we look at, right, is that, is that you're either motivated towards something or you're motivated away from something. And so we can say, hey, if you do these things, you, you can get in and you can be part of the system and that these are the requirements and you have to be this tall in order to play. And, and that all tends to work and, and makes a lot of sense. All right. So flip side, well, how do we penalize them? I mean, the, the reason WordPress is so popular is because its cost is exceptionally low, like it's free. And so people can try their hands, right? We keep suggesting to people learn how to code. So someone goes, hey, I'll go to I'll go to a plugin. They didn't come at it with a developer's mindset. They didn't come at it with a maintenance mindset. They didn't come at it, it was a hobby. They tried it out, they went, well, I'll throw it out there. And then a lot of people liked it and they tried it for a while, got burnt out, walked away from it. So I'm not sure what the penalty is there. I mean, it's, it's a- um, e uh, Image and ego. If you put a ranking to it, where WordPress will give you a ranking, in terms of okay. how well your okay. code is, all right. uh, okay. it, it will make you change. No, I, I, I actually tend to agree with that. Now, there's, there's a secondary issue too, which is how do we encourage people who are not part of the security community or security-minded people mm -hmm. in, in, in this, it, it, not in the development side, go to the other side of the equation. People that are using WordPress when they go, no, but I really want this functionality. Mm -hmm. so, well, you should look at it this way. I mean, is it, it does it have this ranking? Has it, is it this high? Do you, do you understand that? And I think, I think that's where we would have uh, a secondary challenge. Now, I don't think it's insurmountable. I think it's, it, it comes back to what we always talk about with how do you translate that value to somebody? How do you help them understand what's potentially at risk, especially when they start with, uh, I'm just posting up pictures of my kids. I'm just writing about my travels. No one's reading it anyway. Nobody cares, you know. And and so we, I think we would be wise to think through some of those examples and come to something that was pretty universal that people kind of got and went, well, what do I do about it? And we say, well, here's the solution. Right? It's a, it's a multi pronged approach. Yeah, and, and and that's where if WordPress actually, as I mentioned, modified a bit their framework. So, uh, because we're seeing a lot of stuff that is just repetitive, a lot of yeah. stuff that keeps happening and happening. I'm going like, well, many development frameworks out there have actually modified themselves to make SQL injection harder, cross-site scripting harder. Mm -hmm. Can't WordPress just go around, these are the most common ones, let's create an API for plugins and uh, let's make sure that this stuff gets taken in, on, on our framework side and yes, we won't eliminate everything. but Boy, can we reduce kind of like that surface quite drastically of uh, uh, of things that can be done against a website. Yeah, and you know, and Carlos, to your point, I mean, it's it's wide open right now. You can have a WordPress right. plugin that does anything, and there's absolutely no right. restrictions. It's just going to run your PHP code. And I completely agree. There needs to be something in the framework to help these plugins yep. not trip on themselves. The that, other thing like, is, though, I like think I think WordPress, in, in, Joff, you, you want to see that too, right? And, but I think they do that on purpose. I think WordPress's mission is to be that open framework, make it incredibly easy for people to write plugins, have as many plugins as possible, so that in the end, as Mike alluded to, if I want features, I go to WordPress. I mean, that's, that's why a lot of people choose yeah, WordPress. And, and right, so right now, Google's that learning that from the store. What's that, Carlos? Google. Google's learning that from the store. They used to be very open. 
I could code my app, put mm -hmm. it into the store, and in a couple of minutes it would be there available for everybody. Now Google's shifting away from that process, and now they're going like, oh no, we had automated scanning. No, now we are modifying our API. No, now we're mo modifying our permissions. Now the store, yes, there's going to be some somebody looking at some of that code. Yes, we're going to be examining more deeply what actually gets there. And yeah. we're starting to see that open approach seem like, yeah, if we're too open, we're going to get right. So let's close it in a bit. Let's, let's well, put it, some controls. If I could jump in for a second, um, they could, the WordPress folks could do this gradually. I mean, I, I envision yeah. that they could create uh, an, an, an API, a piece of middleware in the framework that, that at least um, started issuing warnings for unsafe practices so that the developers, as they're doing it, would actually see hmm. the, uh, see the uh, framework actually telling them, hey, you're not doing adequate input filtering or, hey, you're not, you're not managing, uh, you know, managing these tokens correctly or, you know, wh whatever the, the case may be. But I could see, you know, dialing it up gradually to the point where it's sort of in a watch mode and then perhaps an enforce mode. Uh, eventually with, with some sort of framework change. So there, there are definitely things that could be done. You know what's interesting about that, Joff, is isn't that essentially, I mean, I'm, 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 I'm shifting the model a bit, but isn't that essentially what, what Google is doing now in terms of driving change, right? They're, they're showing you signs in your browser. They're, they deprecated SHA-1 ahead of schedule. They're, they're doing different types of things now to suggest. And, you know, you can come back to them and say, well, I'm not sure if that's the best schedule. And they're like, yeah, okay, whatever. And, and they just kind of do it their way, right? So it's what, what you're suggesting is give people that feedback at multiple places um, and, and enforce it at different levels. I mean, I, I, it's interesting. You know, I guess the question is, does it matter to WordPress, right? I mean, mm -hmm. like, does uh, automatic yeah, no, it, care? It, it, it has to, right? If they're interested in the success of their project, um, and it affects their image. It's going to tear them down, and it's a reputational image issue, exactly. Yeah, but I think I think what they're pretty good at doing, and, and I mean, you, look, I, I defer to, to all three of you on this, but every time that I've seen anything that comes up that's more in the, the core code, they're on that. I mean, that stuff is knocked out fast. Yep. And and so the big problems that we're reporting at pretty consistently are plug-in, 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 and that gives them the chance yeah, to just kind of throw their hands up Because they're good at the, at the blend go, game. Not yeah, me. Yeah, correct. Yeah, I mean, they're, I don't... They're, they're good at the blend game. They're like, oh, it's the plugins, not us. But yeah, but I, I think there's this, stuff they can do. They need to, to shift the responsibility away from there a little bit. Um, hence, this the suggestion of a middleware. I mean, if they want the project to be successful, no, that's an interesting point. Yeah. Th well, I mean, a, keep in mind too, right? You guys teach me. Right? Some of you have more Android experience, right? So, I mean, we we've we talk models, right? So, if you want to be in the iTunes store, uh, that's a pretty tight sandbox, and they they keep ratcheting that down tighter and tighter. Android for a while was was wild, wild. You want to be in Google Play and knock yourself out. And recently, haven't they started to try to address how oh, they yes. rein that in? Yeah, that's what Carlos was saying earlier, Mike. Yeah, they've definitely. Well, done so that. but so my point is, but they started. Oh, they were pretty they open. They started right? open, yeah. And they started with the whole. Yep. Yeah, it's, it's not us, man. I mean, you know, we did the Android thing, and your carrier does and, the updates, and, 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 and their and their image started being impacted. Well, and and yeah. So so I guess up. I mean what we're because you know I mean Google's big enough that the way that they handle Google Play is going to be different than they handle browser security. But it's an it's an interesting model, and so I guess you know to, to my argument of does do they care? Yeah, I, I guess long term they 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 might care. I mean, what, what's the competition well, I, though? I think I mean, there's what, an anal I think there's an, an an analogy there. Can't, can't say the word. Um, but you know when when um, well the Verizon DBIR report came out this year, and 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 the and the the number in there was ninety three percent of malware on mobile devices is attributable to the Android. You hmm. know. Google's got to care about that, right? I mean, that's like oh, yeah. 93%. That's a big right. deal. Right, okay. So what you're saying then is that from a Google perspective, selling Android on devices, if they want those devices to continue to sell, Android can't be trashed to the mud on a consistent basis. That's but, right. So then how does that translate to WordPress? I mean, what's, what's your where, – so you can go WordPress, in, in, or you can go in, Blogger. In case, what else do you got? Uh, in the case of WordPress, you, you hit a very important point, is that their competition, they don't have kind of that competitor that is kind of biting on their heels for them to move faster. It is kind of like what happened with BlackBerry and then Apple. BlackBerry was, we're king. Mm -hmm. We're right here. There's no competition. We have this market corner. 
And then Apple came with the iPhone and then Google with Android and now look where BlackBerry is. Uh, and it's kind of like a business type decision. Like, do, do we really want to move ahead of the ball? Do we really want to tackle this problem before somebody comes in, offers something just as good at the same time more secure? But that's it's kind you of know, like, like something that has to happen. The, the barrier, the barrier to entry into that um, content management space that WordPress is in is really large because WordPress is playing the popularity game. They're saying we're king because you can get any kind of theme that you want and there's millions to choose from. You can get any plugin that you want and there's millions to choose from. So basically you can have a site that looks however you want it to look and performs and has functions of whatever you want and people are going to choose WordPress because of that. If I'm a new player coming into the market or even an existing player like Drupal or Movable Type, that choice is much harder because there's not the variety of options that you have when it comes to WordPress. Yeah, but, but also you have to look at WordPress also has their hosted model. So if you have that mm -hmm. mixture of a hosted model plus you offer the software right. for people to install, then you go and look at their coder base and you see those plugin writers and the, those theme writers, what are their major complaints? What do they like? What do they hate about this ecosystem? And we're going to address as a minimum feature set, and I know I'm talking now agile development, we're going to address what is that minimum thing that will bring me the most impact it's going to be that ecosystem, th those supporters of that ecosystem. If I go after those supporters of that ecosystem of, of the themes and the plugins, and I told them, hey guys, come now to this platform. Yes, we heard, we heard what were your complaints on WordPress. Mm -hmm. We are addressing these complaints here. Look at this new way for you to interface. Look how easy am I going to make it. Look, I even provi I'm providing you a way for you to uh, Migrate that code over to our code, and plus, I'm making it a bit easier. Uh, showing you where it doesn't migrate it, and give you hints on how to fix it quickly, so you can port your stuff to my stuff quickly. You're going to start to erode that ecosystem from WordPress. Look at that, Carlos has the WordPress killer strategy right there, Carlos. That was awesome. <laughs> that was awesome. I want to talk about healthcare devices, um, and it's seemingly a kind of a similar problem. Um, all these devices that do wonders in healthcare, monitor your, your heart, your IV pumps, have all been known to have serious vulnerabilities. And there's yet another article that had the serious vulnerabilities. But in this article, they recommend, well, we really just need to get security built in from the start. But security, for whatever reason, is not a market driver. So hospitals aren't going to no. buy the most secure IV pump. They're going to buy the one that functions the best as an IV pump and really not take security into that consideration. So yep. there's a couple of issues at play there. And while I, I said in a recent webcast with Michael, <coughs> we just need to bake security in from the beginning, get security involved. Yeah, but you took it much deeper than that, Mike. Feed me. What did I? What did I say? I don't know. You said something really <laughs> smart. I don't know. Feed me. I, I was going to say we got we got to go back to that. I mean, you know, it, it's um. I, I think what I start looking at today, right, is it's we need to do a better job at connecting actions to impacts. So it's it's not just about baking. It. Oh, it's all right. This is when we talk about the trade offs, right, between usability and security yes. and and whatnot. And what I was pointing out was that a lot of times we, we actually lack the visibility of what it is that we're trying to do. And so if we keep thinking of it as an IV pump, then we're not realizing that there's a telemetry component to it. There's a remote component to it that allows us to, to have better evidence so we can do better evidential medicine and everything else. And so when we look at it that way, it's not just an IV pump. So we have to be able to change the way that we're talking about these things mm -hmm. and in incorporate those requirements differently into it. But then that means that when we're developing them, we have to be able to do some of those pieces differently as as well. Was that was that the kind yeah, of yeah. direction that we were that, going with it? That's the direction we were going with it. Yeah. So so here's the here's the takeaway from that. As I continue to think about it, it it's that. I mean, we've been saying, gosh, it's, it's going on full two decades for me, right? Bake, bake it in. You can't bolt it on, which, which isn't always true, by the way. It depends on how it was built. Yeah. But, but let's go ahead and say if it was designed with security or the potential for security in mind, it has a tendency to be stronger and more powerful. The thing that's more interesting about that to me is that when you do that and you do that properly, you know, the studies don't suggest that it costs more money. It, it, it costs less. You know, anecdotally, I remember doing this a couple of years ago, a small town. 
they brought me in to to do a workshop with them, and I asked everybody to just just assess the way that they did what they did. Just that's it. Just just assess the stuff that you're working on, and uh, and I'm not even asking you to make any changes. I'm asking you to spend five minutes a day for each of the next five days. I'm gonna come back next week, and we're gonna talk about what you learned, what's valuable in your environment, and, and what types of changes we need to make. I came back a week later, and they had rearranged the office. They had done all sorts of stuff. I mean, it, it was remarkable the stuff that they had done. And truly, wasn't anticipated. It wasn't like a, a trick on my part. And but I but I remember saying because I, I and I did this very specifically. I said, "Well, this sounds great. So let me ask you a question. I only asked you to spend twenty five minutes on this, and I feel like you probably spent two or three hours." Their candid answer was, "No, no. This this only took us like maybe a half hour. There's no way possible that they could have moved the things. That, so it didn't feel like a burden to them, which is the most important part." But then secondary, I said, all right, well, so I appreciate now that you're doing things that are more secure. You've changed some of your processes. You've changed the way that you allow access to like physical security as well as some of the computer stuff. We had great conversations all of a sudden about firewalls, how firewalls acted, what you should or shouldn't do with browsers. I said, so guys, how much time did you add to your day to do this? And they laughed. And I said, you know, that's the funny part. We figured out we were doing a lot of stuff pretty inefficiently. And by rearranging it, thinking about security a little bit better, we're more secure, but we've saved time in our day. Uh huh. And and I find that over and over again. So you know, it's not about we got to get involved first, so security can be there and tell you what the problems are and tell you what's wrong and, and block it and, and prevent you from screwing up later. Flip that around. Hey, let's get involved earlier so we can understand what it is you're trying to do and we can ask some questions. But you know, one of the things I see a lot of times in the design is is we say, well, I, I I'm the security guy. So what what kind of security do you want? And, and the people look at us and they go, you're the security guy. You, mm -hmm. you tell me. And then so we go, oh, well, the default is out. No, 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 that's the wrong conversation. The, the, the leadership-oriented conversation, as we were talking about yesterday, is to say, help me understand what we're trying to protect. Help me understand how people use it. Help me understand the flow of that information. And in any potential way that that device gets used or that, that code gets used, okay, cool. Now, what would happen if, right? And you play some scenarios. And by the way, when you do this, people typically start with well, nothing, nothing bad. I don't, I don't know what you're talking about. Nothing would happen, right? And okay, cool. But what if, right? And you play that game, and then you get them involved with it, and you say, okay, cool. So it sounds like we need to protect it here, here, and here. And we need to do this, this, and this. And people go, yeah. How do we do that? And you say, I got a couple ideas. Let me, let me take a look at it. Let me come back. Let me show you some mock-ups, and, and let people test some of these things. I mean, if you sat in a room full of, of people today, in most cases. And you said, hey, I'm going to do token-based two-factor authentication. That cool with everybody? They're either going to look at you and go, I don't even know what that means. Or they're just going to go, yeah, okay, whatever. Because, because no, they didn't know what that means. It, it's interesting. Um, Apple in iOS 9 has come out and said that they're increasing the PIN numbers to six that. digits. To six, yeah. And implementing two-factor authentication. Carl, Carlos, I want to get your thoughts on this one. Did you read? The, oh. Did you see this article about iOS nine? Uh, I saw a couple of tweets on it, and I was thinking about it. Like, it, it's uh, I do applaud Apple now with their move to more privacy, more encryption, and again, it is how you're measured. You is how you will behave. In their case, they have a competitor, which is Google, where I'm going to give you all of this stuff for free. I'm going to make your life a lot easier. Just give me a bit more data on yourself. And they're kind of shifting and do and doing kind of like an Aikido type move, using yeah. your opponents of yeah, movement and force against them. And we're going yeah. okay. Uh, you want free stuff, but hey, this is how they're going to use this. And Apple decided our best approach is to be the security focused one, the one that wants to pr uh, provide that privacy. And this is how we're going to, this is how we're projecting ourselves. So this is how we're going to be measured. So let's modify the way we behave and code yep. all of our stuff. And now security, it, it becomes part of that branding, part of that thing that can get tarnished. So they're putting more effort into it. Mm -hmm. And now that's where you're seeing two-factor authentication being more popular. That's when you're seeing uh, more protections in their frameworks and their APIs. That's when you're seeing, hey, now you need six, uh, six uh, letters to protect. Oh, but it's still optional. So right. not that they're going to force you to do it, it's still optional. But you have that option and you have a secure option that they can go. It's a lot harder for anybody to kind of break this. And at the same time, it's kind of like that middle in between of having two extra more numbers for you to enter. Plus, you have your fingerprint that you can use to enter automatically. 
in addition that you can also put a password. So they're just bumping that bar just that little bit, creating a more uh, more difficult for it to be attacked, and at the same time improving their image. So it is kind of like a very good move on their part uh, and new strategy that they have taken. Yeah, plus one for the Aikido reference. I always yeah. I always love it because, <laughs> I, well, Aikido, what's, what's remarkable is if, if somebody's not familiar with it, it's a circular art. It's not about strength versus strength. It's it's about energy and blending energy and then redirecting that energy, right? So you can certainly use it against your attacker, but you can also guide them safely to another place uh, as we used to. I used to practice Aikido, and, and one of the things we used to say is I can – I can guide you uh, to where you didn't know you needed to be, right? It's it's the it's a nice way of, of basically saying you're going to do what I'd like now. Mm -hmm. um, but but yeah, I mean, Carlos points out something really powerful about what Apple has done in in the wake of Snowden and the NSA revelations and global concerns of privacy, plus some of the quote hacks on uh, some of the iCloud stuff. They came out and said, no, you know what? Privacy is important to us. Yep, it matters. All right, here's what we're gonna do. And, and we've watched them, even with the, the successive releases of OS X. They, they add a couple more privacy controls to it. They add a couple more security controls to it. They've ratcheted down what they're doing in their sandboxes and, and, and their, their stuff. And, and that's becoming a big part of where they're getting press now. We care. We, we want to protect you. Look how we're helping you do Apple that. Apple loves that's you. Unless you're awesome. more than a revision yeah. behind on Keynote, in which case they <laughs> hate you. <laughs> Joff, Joff, you've been kind of quiet over there, buddy. You've been traveling this week? Uh, yeah, I've been traveling this week. But but you know what? There's a lot of talk with, with what you guys were saying. It all comes down to this, I think. They're starting to get hurt. And when people are starting to get hurt, they start paying attention. And uh, I think I, I have to give Apple... I'm credit for paying attention. It's good. They're making moves in the right direction. Uh, and, you know, we, we all want that. In the security community, we want that. We like to whine about this stuff, and we like to break it and stuff. But it's a good thing when it gets fixed in the right direction. It's, uh, not fixed. That's too absolute. It's a good thing when companies take good steps to improve things, you know, good yep. steps that are current. So. And, and what I like is that they're going with the baby steps. They're not going, oh, uh, like what happened with Vista or with other kind of so, uh, solutions out there. Let's implement all of this security stuff. Let's put it right. all out there. And it was just too big a bite to, to swallow. You know, but if we're fair, right? I mean, so so we're praising Apple. Uh, we've already brought up Google doing it. And, and Microsoft, I know mm -hmm. there's a love-hate with it, but, but they have done a lot over the last decade to increase security, and they continue to press on it. And so what's kind of interesting now is that we're at a place where the tech giants, their security is first and for foremost in their agendas, that bodes well because they're tasked with how do you explain this to consumers? And I, I think for the most part, they're doing a decent job with it. Well, I think it, I think it bodes well and it really bodes well because they're going to be looked, hopefully looked up to by the smaller software vendors as the way to do things. Yep. So it, it has, I think, potentially a multiplier effect, which is, which is a good thing. So how does this translate to those routers at home? <laughs> um, I don't know. Oh, so, I uh, there, so 60 undisclosed vulnerabilities affecting 22 Soho routers. That article is out there for you to read, and it's it's the same thing that we've talked about. It's just that's blah. I don't know. I'd rather talk about. Um, I would rather talk about using. SSH keys, weak SSH keys to access to GitHub repositories for popular projects. Now, is this the one that the Nmap uh, had an issue with as well? I know. The, pr the problem with Nmap was with... Uh, it was different. Uh, yeah, with the good friends at Security uh, for oh, not Security Forge, Source SourceForge. SourceForge. That they kind of took over that account and started uh, giving you an installer of Nmap, but at the same time, hey, let's put this Appware here, this other app here, and this other app, and this uh, browser ba uh, toolbar here also as you download this. Uh, and Fyodor kind of uh, brought that publicly. In the case of the keys, um, I was looking at the data, and there weren't so many weak keys from what I could see. What I really did find interesting was how many of them were kind of like... Uh, similar to one another and it brought back this uh, a common problem 
uh, that many people when they generate their initial keys there's not enough entropy or problems when they recently installed Linux and during the install of Linux it tried to gather all of this type of entropy and, and do it and the problem is when you're in the process of install there's not much data you can gather from that system so right. there um, it they is should, kind of a, a complex you know, they should problem. Really, um, I, there's a, a, a couple of tools that I remember installing over the years of just being in technology where they'll ask you, the user for entropy and they'll ask you to type random stuff on the keyboard <laughs> until they collect they enough it, entropy. The mouse? Move the mouse? Or move the mouse, right? So, I mean, yeah. the user can be a collector of entropy as well. Have yeah, but haven't they speak? demonstrated oh, almost every time it's not actually random? Well, maybe not. Joff, did you, were you say something? Yeah, I, I just want to jump in on that one because, um, you know, recently I was, I was generating um, Diffie-Hellman param files at a 4096-bit strength with OpenSSL, right? Um, and what I learned, and maybe it's a little bit of an older version of OpenSSL, so I don't take this as an authoritative comment, but I don't think OpenSSL by default uses dev urandom as its random source. And if you pass it in as an argument, all of a sudden your random number generation, A, gets a whole lot faster, um, and, and B, hopefully gets a whole lot more, a whole lot stronger, sorry, <laughs> more strong, yeah. Um, so we may have some defaults issues uh, in the SSL, open SSL space still that need to be looked at. Uh, is my point of making that um, that comment, and yeah. I think um, that there is um, maybe it was Carlos that was alluding to it, and, and yourself, Paul. There's issues with with initial installs uh, of OSs and and apps where they've got some older defaults in them that may not be the appropriate ones anymore. Mm -hmm. uh, because so, it, yeah. if you go into the GitHub page and you look at their guide for generating SSH keys, they're actually telling you to use a elliptic curve. Uh, for your SSH keys, they're right. giving you very good byte uh, sizes for uh, bit sizes for the keys. So they they really have very good documentation on how to create a very secure key. Many times, what people go is I put it up Linux. Linux generated a key pair for me automatically during the install. Yes, it was during install. Those keys tend to tend to be weak. Um, when yeah, you go and that's the one that I'm going to use. I'm not going to generate a new one and just use that one. So it's a best practice when you install a clean environment with Linux or SSH, generate, regenerate your keys after you're finished installing and you have a bit of software on it. Great. Well, I also wonder how much this issue is impacted by developers that have been active on projects for a long, long time and they've developed, yeah. I mean, they've developed using the SSH key they might have generated uh, for the project you know, six years ago. Um, you know, or something of that nature, and, and they've left it in the repo and they've just assumed it, you know, and, yeah. and we all get a bit lazy, right? You know, we leave it in the repo, we're oh, like, yeah. okay, yeah, I can still do my commits, it's great, it's working working fine. Um, but, I have but, to yeah, admit, I'm might, one of those. Yeah, and it might be, a, you know, it might be a 10, 24-bit key with not adequate randomness, might even be a 512-bit key, who knows? Um, oh, and, uh, yeah. you know, that that's... Um, that is not sufficient. It, it, it would be nice if GitHub would actually check that and tell you, hey, you haven't changed your key in two years or, uh, That's a good or, point. or in a year and actually kind of give you a small warning and a banner every time you log in. You see this red bar in the top like, hey, you need to rotate your keys or you need to create new keys. That would be kind of a very good incentive. Yes, it would piss people at the beginning, but <laughs> they'll get used to it. Or how long till they ignore it, right? I mean, isn't there a counter effect? Oh yeah, uh, like 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 when you train monkeys, uh, not not sorry, users, uh, yep. to always click <laughs> OK oh, on oh, Java. Whoa, we're Java not you, 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 you don't deploy your Java certificate store. You don't sign your stuff, and all of a sudden your users are already accustomed of going OK, so they can get to their Oracle CRM map. Uh, oh, Java app is not signed. OK. And they're trying to OK, and all of a sudden you do a pen test. You just set, you push that Java applet, and they just go automatically with a Pavlovian effect of, oh, screen, Java, OK, boop. And they just salivate and just click on it. Yeah, it's, it's, um, it's <laughs> train monkeys. I love that. Uh, no, it's, a, it's an interesting challenge, right? For the record, I don't, I don't love that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, Mike has a very strong opinion about that, but. <laughs> 
Well, uh, Mike has strong opinions. Mike has strong like, opinions. Yeah. yeah. That's what. Well, that's why we like having him on the show. We I'm don't like water. I flow. That's right. We yeah. don't. You know, we all don't necessarily have all the same ideas or thoughts or share the same that's opinions. Stuff. That's what makes for a good show. No fun. Yeah. Yeah. It's when we differ in opinion. Sorry, Joff. Were you saying? I, what I, I don't, what I else? Don't yeah. even, I don't even remember what, what I was else saying. do you guys? What else do you guys want to talk about? I mean, it was kind of a light week for stories. For example, Joff, did you saw what happened to Korspersky this week? Mm. Yeah, yeah. yeah I, I heard. I heard Symantec called him up and said, "You need any help?" <laughs> yeah. What, what, what actually happened was that Korspersky issued a report where they said, "Yes, we were breached. It was uh, a type, um, a state type APT, advanced APT." And when they started going through it, I was looking at their write up and yes it was an advanced apt yes it has some very very nifty techniques of persisting into memory what information together how they their command and control structure and the part that actually uh, struck me as interesting was when they started doing the comparisons between the first version of dooku and this apt a lot of that code was reused and going like oh and then that's why they named it dooku 2.0 and it came back to uh, a very nice quote is that the attackers, who are, uh, whoever they are, Israeli, U.S., whoever, um, when we look at this, uh, they made this point, like, they spent so much time developing a framework, they're just not going to throw it away. It takes oh, effort, right. it takes time to develop it. So if it got burned one time, we're just going to limit the scope of targets, let's change as much as we can, but we're still going to reuse a lot of that code. And I really have to applaud them. Yes, we uh, they actually went, yes, we got breached. This is what happened. And they're open about it, and they're willing to talk about it. Uh, yes, it's PR, and at the same time, I see it as a good practice for others to learn. They put files on the IOCs. Um, I really do applaud them for that, that they came up with it, even though it has its own PR political spin to it. Yeah, it's a, that's a, that was a, a really big decision for them because obviously being in the antivirus industry, um, there, there was a, a, a significant, you know, stating the obvious here, but a significant reputational risk in coming out like that. Um, but, you know, they might have a chance of coming back very strong having done that and taken that approach. So I, I agree with you, uh, Carlos. I applaud them for, for being upfront about it. Yep. And I have to say, uh, of all of, this, uh, uh, all of the AVs out there, Karspersky is one of the ones that I have the highest, uh, highest respect for. Yes, they're a bit heavy on resources. But when it comes to detecting stuff, I have found them to be quite good. Anything else that you guys wanted to talk about? I had some other stories in there. I'm not sure they're, they're worth mentioning or talking about. Some I put in there for, for Kevin, or not Kevin, who's not here. Uh, <laughs> oh, there was one on hacking garage doors. If you guys saw I, that. I saw that one. Yeah. Uh, it, it was even on one of the tactical forums I go, uh, I go to. Yeah, uh, and that was, from, uh, that. that was from Sammy. Some of you may know Sammy yeah. from the MySpace worm. Sammy is my hero. That's the same Sammy. Um, it turns out he's done a lot more than create that MySpace worm, which got him <laughs> in a little trouble. But uh, he's a great guy. I met him at BrewCon. Sam has gone on to do all kinds of different projects. We talk about his uh, cracking the uh, master lock combination locks. Um, and he's done some other great work as well. The garage door thing is his latest research, and he always seems to come up with really cool uh, projects. And I couldn't believe we haven't had him on the show. So he is booked for sometime this summer. Uh, to come on the show to talk about all of his projects, including the recent one that is uh, Hacking Garage Doors. He basically took one of those IME, those little pink, uh, purple-ish devices that, you know, they made for kids to, you know, instant message each other. Uh, he took one of those and hacked it to be able to, um, to brute force garage doors, which I think is interesting. Does it brute force the, I, you know, I, I only saw the headlines on this, I didn't get into it. Does it brute force the ones that have the rolling security codes? I'm not. I'm not sure. There is a set list of one. It, it does not, but there is a set list of ones that it does. Okay. I think from a physical security perspective, it's not really high up on my list. I think if you're, if you're not home, it, it probably does. It probably means you know if you are home, hmm. chances are someone's not going to use the garage door to get in because it makes a lot of noise. I mean, it's just basic common sense, right? Um, if it's a situation where you're not home. 
uh, that could be the point of entry, uh, in which case you hope you have some defense in depth. Um, my defense in depth, you know, tends to be firearms. But again, if you're not home, you know, you don't have that, that yeah, option. In, so. in fact, um, my wife was asking me, why do I have, right now with my system, if I have a kind of a tilt sensor on yeah, the door, in too. my garage door, so if, if, if somebody opens that door, I'm going to get an alert when it opens and closes. Also, I have a motion sensor inside of my garage. So if somebody somehow was able to break the top, fit in, scoot in, and just get into the garage, that will trigger. Then I have another sensor in, in the door itself, plus a shatter sensor on the glass on the door. So it's kind of like defense in depth mm. right there. And the thing is that, yeah, in high school, I used to hang not with the right people. And I remember many of them just going through the different techniques that they used to do their uh, uh, mischievery and stuff like that. And I have to say, criminals are very, very smart. And well, they very do clever. go into yeah. the, and they'll go into the web and they'll see, oh, I can build this device. It's only a couple of bucks. It's so easy to do. I'm going to learn to solder. Oh, right. let's go to YouTube. Dude, oh, that's this is not, how you they're going to go find some kid in high school and give him 20 bucks to do it as a project. For it's him. true. It's true. Yeah, yeah, they'll blackmail somebody or or have they somebody won't even pay. blackmail them. They'll just do Oh, okay. dude, they'll... I got, I I got blackmailed so many times to do that stuff, but yeah, uh. it's it's going to be done. So, uh, Carl, <laughs> Carl, so are you I, using your your smart things to monitor your garage door with your tilt sensor? Yeah. Yeah, me too. Yep. It's great. It's awesome. I Enterprise like it. Had, had a you, special launch. So just so if I get this right, you guys, what you guys need to do is you need to set up a WordPress-driven website to monitor <laughs> your Internet of That's Things right. connected devices from your home router. Uh, yeah, and then I, I think we've covered. Well, the news. I, I monitor it through my smartphone, which runs right. an app which talks right. to a web application that's in oh. the cloud. So it's yeah, just and a the secure. smartphone's got to be an Android, of course. It's yeah, be yeah it's only good yeah. if it's an Android. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> now, now that we're talking about uh, IoT stuff, I was very surprised uh, this week. I actually got a new Raspberry Pi two. I said I want to play with the new Windows for IoT, and I was surprised to find out that Microsoft built their own OpenSSH server. Hmm. Uh, and I, I installed it and was, oh, SSH open. Oh, what version of SSH is so, uh, it's running? It's running us under SV host. Huh. So Microsoft is actually, um, they even did a blog post uh, right the same day that they released that image for Windows IoT that Microsoft is actually going to be uh, implementing SSH into Windows. Yeah, we covered that last week, Carlos, and that's server, oh. and, that's server and client, correct? Yep. And yeah. and the uh, PowerShell team is going to be in charge of that project, and they're actually looking to hire developers. The PowerShell the PowerShell team seems like they're the cool kids at Microsoft, huh? They don't get all the money, but they do the cool. Stuff. They do some cool stuff, yeah. Because PowerShell like just has taken off lately. Yep. In, in fact, my class sold out in two weeks. Yeah, it's, it's a hot topic. That's pretty cool. Yeah, I heard that. I heard that, Carlos. I really wanted to get a seat in there, man. We're gonna have to talk. But um, yeah, don't, don't worry. Just come in, sit down. Just I'll even have sit, a, yeah. I, I'll even have a challenge coin for you. Oh, nice. nice. I, I, I do want to bring something up, Paul, which I think is very, very important. And um, uh, Spaff, uh, Gene Spaff, had, um, had a very, very good blog post on this, and I think it's it's worth mentioning it. Um, you know, maybe it was mentioned last week. I don't know, but I think his post was June the sixth, so perhaps not. Um, so it goes like this. If you don't mind me going into this, and, and this is. Uh, um, somewhat political, but de deja vu all over again, the attack on encryption. Um, so everybody knows uh, that's in the community that, that uh, the law enforcement community and the, and the government are, are sort of coming at us again to try to backdoor encryption. And the deja vu yeah. comment that Spaff had was, uh, was essentially that this happened 20 years ago back in the late 90s where um, the, the clipper chip discussion was going on. And we really are going around that same cycle again. And I do want to read out a couple of things from the post really quick. I'll try to keep it very short. But here are some of the nice salient arguments um, that, uh, as, as Spaff said, are, are specious now as they were 20 years ago. So here are the few of the reasons why that uh, this, this entire idea of backdooring encryption is bad. And it goes like this. Weakening encryption to catch a small number of bad guys puts a much larger community of law-abiding citizens and companies at risk. 
Strong encryption is needed more than ever now to protect data at rest and in transit. Um, a golden key or weakened cryptography is likely to be discovered by others. Uh, let's look at that in the context, and I'm, I'm, I'm uh, paraphrasing here, look at that in the context of uh, what is going on with uh, the 4 million records uh, breached in the Office of Personnel Management. You know, is the government actually really good at protecting uh, information? And if they had a backdoor and a golden key, that would be a, a, a dreadful thing if it got breached. Mm. There, there are no guarantees that the access methods won't be, won't be breached. Um, yeah, and, and, and you do bring up a very good post. I had another approach to it, but I really prefer yours. Uh, yeah. that, that, that is a very good point. Will the you government know, and, be and, able to yeah, keep yeah, those keys secure? You know, and here's another one that's in SPAF's post. Consumers in other countries are not going to want to buy hardware and software that has backdoors built in for the U.S. government. Is this actually a good thing? Um, I'm so, already you know, seeing that uh, for, from different people that are telling me, no, I will not go to Assure. Uh, I will not use Assure. I will not use Amazon. Why? Haven't you seen what the U.S. has done? I'm like, yeah, cool. And, and and back to the government stuff, my approach was, uh, I don't know, there, there's a new movie called 1971 that goes into what the FBI has done. I remember uh, th there's this guy from the security community that was, uh, I'm not going to mention his name, who was very vocal when people uh, were saying, well, the FBI cannot be fully trusted. It's the FBI. We can trust the FBI. Well, they have had a very bad history. And uh, again, with government uh, I have to admit, the U.S. is a bully when it comes to international market. We'll we'll try to get our way. We'll do whatever we need to do to get what we want. And the government's the same way in their agencies. Here we saw the FBI gathering information on citizens and the civil rights movement and others, using that information, then blackmailing those people because that's they thought that was the correct thing. So if we start, uh, and they're going like, well, it's the government. I need to trust the government to promise that. Stuff changes throughout the years. Governments, laws, fears, and uh, and uh, motivations change throughout the years. So the tools that we give right now to a government that is nice to us to a certain degree may be not as nice in a couple of years because that's stuff right. changes. That that's exactly right. And I, and I hate to sound like Jack, but I'm going to. So this is like I'm doing the Jack fill in here. But but as usual, uh, Spaff is I think right on target. Yeah, he's right on point with uh, that. Sure. And, and and you know, Spaff is is the uh, the chair of the ACM U.S. Public Policy Council, um, who's very engaged in this. But I really encourage folks in our community to you know get behind this, take a read of this. I think um, you know we do have an opportunity to get active and. Um, I, I do think that uh, if the law enforcement community gets its way here, we're going to really be in a bad place. So, um, I, and I'm not anti-law enforcement; they need tools for sure. But this one is is not something that that uh, I honestly think we need to let happen. We've we've got to you know stay strong on this, uh, and it is it is deja vu. It's clipper chip all over again. So, do encourage people to go read and get active. I want to I want to close things out right there. I believe our in studio guest is just arriving, so we're going to do a little shuffling. We're going to take a short break. We're going to come back and we're going to talk about security for startup companies. So stay tuned. Don't go anywhere.